I'm going to show you, first of all, a slide you'll all be very familiar with in terms of the disease burden globally from chronic hepatitis B. But I'm going to actually draw your attention to the uh, left side of this graphic, showing you that 80% of death uh, that occur in chronic hepatitis B are actually occurring in those who are infected at birth or in early childhood. So these are the important challenges that we face, that we think the the exposure to the virus over a very long period of time is what drives chronicity and which goes on to drive the development of more advanced disease. So what are the unmet challenges in hepatitis B today? Well, first of all, we would say that strategies to achieve surface antigen loss or a functional cure is certainly an unmet need. We're all very familiar that the patients in my clinic and in your clinics, the reason we have to hold on to them is that we're worried about the development of HCC in these patients. Also, in terms of prospects for cure, are we able to define treatment endpoints? And at this point, are we able to offer finite therapies? And we're all familiar with the answers to these, meaning that it's a no, and we're unable to either offer a finite therapy at this juncture or indeed define what the treatment endpoint is. So I'm going to try and uh, focus on these issues today and see if we're able to move forward a little bit more in our understanding. This is a uh, cartoon of the life cycle of chronic hepatitis B. You'll all be very familiar with it. And I've just highlight, highlighted the reverse transcriptase here, where a nukes focus on inhibiting reverse transcriptase and in doing so, causing viral, su viral suppression. Unfortunately, the nuke-based therapies don't do anything to the reservoir of virus, that is the mini chromosomes of CCC DNA, which exist within the nucleus of the hepatocyte. And this is basically remains within the individual, we think, for the lifetime, and is the reason for chronicity, reactivation, and quite often the reason for reactivation when you withdraw the nuke in the first place. So my interest really in hepatitis B over a long period of time has been trying to better understand the disease. So if the current therapies we're using don't offer us a very good cure, we want to know why that is. We want to go back to the drawing board, if you want, in terms of defining the disease in the natural history. This is a, a schematic of chronic hepatitis B, that giving you the four disease phases, which are all very familiar with textbooks which describe chronic hepatitis B uh, for, for the years at this point. What I'll draw your attention to, though, and what's important from our point of view, is in fact we only offer therapy to two of these phases at this point. That's the immune active phase here and the immune escape or E antigen negative chronic hepatitis B phase. But what is it if we got this initial categorization wrong, and if we did so, we're offering therapy, maybe we're limiting therapy to disease phases that we shouldn't, and maybe we should broaden that a little bit more. One of the things which may have helped over the recent years is the addition of quantitative surface antigen into our disease profiling and disease assessment. Why, why is that? I'm going to just show you here in E antigen positive high viremic patients, patients with very high levels of surface antigen, we think tolerize the immune response, and this is why you don't tend to get much in the way of activity or biochemical activity in these patients. But also, interestingly, if you go over to this immune control phase, or your asymptomatic or inactive carrier, here surface antigen can tell us about disease progression or risk of hepatocellular cancer. So we think the addition of quantitative surface antigen as we move forward may actually help us to better manage chronic hepatitis B over the coming years and looking at new therapies as they come in. So what is our current understanding? Is it accurate? Are these disease phases accurate? And first of all, I'm going to tell you that I don't think they are. And these are some data published in a paper of ours from gastroenterology in 2012. And what they show you is PD-1 expression on T cells, the CD4 and CD8 T cells. And this is important because I'm going to come back to PD-1 a little bit later on. If these patients here were truly immune tolerant, we would have no expression of PD-1, which is a marker of disease activity and exhaustion. But actually, what we were clearly able to show was that there's no difference in this PD-1 expression in these patients labeled immune tolerant from those who are labeled immune active. So if you take young patients under the age of 30 in the clinic, you divide them based on their clinical categorizations, immunologically, we're not able to distinguish them from being tolerant from immune active based on the expression of this exhaustion marker. More importantly, when we look at this a little bit more, we're able to show you that as the patients get older on this graphic here, the uh, number of fully exhausted CD8 T cells, so this is the CD127 low uh, PD1 positive CD8 T cells, as the patients get older, the T cells become more exhausted, and as they become more exhausted, we fail in our ability to control the virus, 
And that may also be very important for the timing of some of the new therapeutic interventions that we're talking about as we go forward. Now I'm going to bring you up to 2016. This is in this month's edition of Gastroenterology. It's a paper of ours with Bill Mason at the Fox Chase Cancer Center. And what I'm showing you here is something basically in the liver that we're developing from our immunological studies earlier on. You'll all be very familiar with the Ishak fibrosis stage, biopsying these patients. And in these young patients, we were able to show no difference in the amount of fibrosis, as you can see here, in young patients labeled immune tolerant, labeled immune active, or E antigen negative immune active patients. Even when we look at collagen proportionate areas, so this is, just, this is now just focusing here on the collagen deposition alone as a marker of fibrosis and architectural change. Again, we see no difference in these patients labeled tolerant from those immune active in this young age group that we're studying. But importantly, we do see some subtle difference when we study the tissue. And what I'm showing you here is immune tolerant patients. This is nuclear core staining in this, new, in this tolerant patient group. And if we look at nuclear core staining, not a standard stain that we would do with our histopathologists in clinical practice, but we're clearly able to see that this nuclear core staining seems to differentiate out some of these patients as tolerant from those who've got immune active or E antigen negative chronic hepatitis B. And it won't come as any surprise to you to see this red. Of course, this red is the classical ground glass appearance of surface antigen staining. And that seems very similar in these E antigen positive immune active and E antigen negative immune active groups. So these are the subtle changes that we're seeing at a cellular level that I think we need to understand better to determine how we're going to manage these patients better as we go forward. But now I'm going to show you something that may worry you all a little bit more because I know here in Romania, similar to our population in the UK, the majority of patients that we treat will be E antigen negative chronic hepatitis B patients. But I'm going to look at this slide in reverse and I'm going to show you this clonal hepatocyte expansion here showing you the highest clones present in patients with hepatocellular cancer, next highest in those E antigen negative chronic hepatitis B patients, but look here at these immune active and immune tolerant patients, so-called at least based on clinical categorizations. They're virtually the same age, 22 and 21. They've got the same amount of clonal hepatocyte expansion. If we work backwards, you see the highest clones again in the antigen negative chronic hepatitis B. But back to the immune tolerant patients, we're seeing the presence of this clonal hepatocyte expansion in patients as young as 15 suggesting the immune response in even these young patients may be driving the very early phases of hepatic carcinogenesis and chronic hepatitis B. So a worrying thought. So this is really the reason why we've uh, focused on this so much to get people back to the drawing board in terms of defining the disease state. And in our most recent publication in gastroenterology out this month, you will see that we refer to this phase of the disease as the high replication low inflammatory phase because we don't consider these patients to be immunologically tolerant anymore. You might ask me, how is that going to change anything? Well, it does change something, because if we categorize the patients differently into this high replication, low inflammatory change, it doesn't necessarily exclude these patients from treatment, and more importantly, some of the new treatments which are in development. So this is an important point to think about when you look at these patients in the future in your clinic. But where are we with current treatment and management strategies? Well, you'll all be very familiar with pegylated interferon and nukes. What are the virtues of pegylated interferon? Probably the only one is that we can offer a finite course of treatment. Unfortunately, it's only successful in a, in a minority of patients. It, it has an immunomodulatory effect. So some of the things we learn from pegylated interferon, we might be able to apply with some of the newer agents as we go forward. More commonly, we all tend to use nukes because they're very easy to use. When patients take them, they provide excellent viral suppression. Unfortunately, however, they're a long-term therapy. There are no treatment endpoints, and we also know that they're very poor in their ability to reduce surface antigen, specifically in that E antigen negative chronic hepatitis B cohort. So while nukes are very good and very easy to use in the clinic, they have some serious limitations. On a positive side, we do know that if you have a patient with established fibrosis, we know from the Marcelin data and previous data on Entecavir, that we're able to achieve reversal of fibrosis in these patients, but can we prevent hepatocellular cancer? And that's probably the next question that we're going to need to look at more in our clinical practice. So what would I say about current therapies? Pegylated interferon can offer sustained immune control, but in very few patients. E antigen negative and positive disease when you treat patients with a nuke, 
we get limited decline in surface antigen and the patient must remain on the nuke lifelong based on current recommendations because we know that this is not sustained immune control when you take the nuke away. So we're still at a stage whereby we have to prescribe these drugs for indefinite periods and monitor the patients while they're on them. Also, nukes for very long periods of time are not without uh, side effects and this is a paper from the Journal of Infectious Diseases that we published a couple of years ago showing reductions of bone mineral density in patients, young patients treated with tenofovir. So what are the available options? Well, we're not at a stage in the clinic that we have new therapies either in the UK, Romania or anywhere else for that matter that we're able to add in new therapies or bring new therapies outside of clinical trials to the patients. So we need to look at what we can use, what the available tools we have at the moment to try to achieve better outcomes. The first of those is sequential therapy strategies. And these are, uh, this is a paper from PLOS Pathogens published this summer from our group. And it shows you here that when you give pegylator interferon in the blue, you follow it with a sequential nuke. We're able to show that we get a sustained change in the NK cell responses here, which is maintained over a period of time superior to that given in nuke monotherapy shown here in the green. So we're saying that when you give a nuke following pegylator interferon, you're getting a treatment advantage over either pegylator interferon alone or the nuke alone. And we can show you that by the surface antigen reduction. So here in the red, we're showing you patients treated with this sequential therapy strategy have got a greater reduction in the surface antigen. And this is validated in a bigger proportion of populations studied in my clinic at the Royal London. What about combination strategies? Well, you will be familiar with these two because this is the ARRAE study, and the ARRAE study was about the addition of pegylator interferon to a nuke, and the addition of that pegylator interferon showed clear superiority over the nuke alone in terms of reduction in surface antigen here, in terms of reduction in E antigen, suggesting again that these sequential therapy strategies may be providing a treatment advantage over what we're currently using uh, as standard of care. But what about discontinuation of nukes? Everywhere I go, I get asked about this. Can we stop nukes? Is it safe to stop nukes? Well, you'll all be very familiar with the data from the Far East and other places looking at discontinuation of nukes in the ancient positive disease. Cut a long story short, the longer the period of consolidation therapy, the younger the patients. Going back to what I showed you earlier about that functionality of the T cell response, it seems like we are able to discontinue nukes with sustained immune control of nukes in the antigen positive patients. So this is an important point. Again, it's coming back to the age and it's coming back to the functionality of the immune response and our ability to discontinue therapy in some patients. But what about E antigen negative patients? The majority of your patients, the majority of my patients in the clinic on long-term nuke therapy will be E antigen negative patients. This is the most recent work we've been studying a group of E-antigen negative patients where we've gone to a very comprehensive immunoprofiling using CYTOF, T-cell phenotyping by cytometry, also CYTOF looking at antigen specificity, messenger RNA expression by nanospring, and antigen specific T-cell response by ELISPOT. Again, what we're able to identify here is that there are a group of patients who seem to control virus in the antigen negative disease. And I'm going to classify these together as controllers and partial controllers, patients who don't have a hepatic or biochemical flare. These are patients who are not causing harm to their liver when we stop their drugs. What was the one thing we were able to see which stood out in these patients? And that is the presence of a virus-specific response directed against the polymerase part of the virus. So again, it may be that this may be a biomarker for immune control of therapy, the presence of a virus-specific response directed against polymerase. And also, interestingly again, we have another story around PD-1 expression outside of that fully exhausted profile which may be able to control the virus. And this is something I hope, a manuscript that you will see soon on this uh, treatment strategy. But what are the novel strategies as we move forward? I mean, everybody wants to know, what will I be giving to my patient in the clinic in three or five years? Well, I think within the short term, you're going to be looking at clinical trials only, and those clinical trials most commonly will be the addition of a new agent to a nuke which is virally suppressing your patient. So you'll all be very familiar with some of the boosting of the HPV-specific adaptive immunity by T-cell vaccination. We have a couple of ongoing studies in the UK looking at the addition of T-cell vaccine on these nuke virally suppressed patients. 
But more interesting, what about PD-1 or TIM-3 or some of these uh, checkpoint molecules where we can use checkpoint inhibitors? There's been a lot of talk about these, and this is something that we may see come into the field, and I'm going to discuss it a little bit more in a later slide. But what about direct inhibition of DNA, RNA, or proteins? Well, you'll be familiar with blocking entry, but we don't think an entry blocker is going to do anything for the established chronic infection and that established pool of CCC DNA which resides within the hepatocyte. So that alone is not going to help. But within these agents would also be the siRNAs, and there are some trials moving from phase one to phase two shortly for siRNAs, which we should see some development over the coming years. What about boosting of the innate immunity? Well, here I would say replace pegylator interferon with something like a TLR agonist, and Gilead's uh, phase two study has just completed globally uh, this summer looking at the TLR7. There are other agents to consider here, but that's probably the one which is closest to the clinic. What do we know about the TLR agonist? This is GS9620, uh, Gilead's TLR7, and we know that the phase one study showed that this was safe, and the pharma pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamic studies allowed us to proceed to the phase two, which, as I said, is just completed globally. What about current trials about therapeutic vaccine? As I said, there are a few of these ongoing, one in the UK that I'm involved with at the moment, and the major hurdle we've had there is that this is a first-in-man T-cell vaccine, and patients obviously aren't queuing up to go into this. They say, well, I'm happy to take my nuke until I see more data on some of these agents. But you're going to see more of these T-cell vaccines as we go forward. The majority of these, again, will be in the context of nuke virally suppressed patients. What about reversal of T-cell exhaustion? Well, this goes right back to the start of my talk where I talk about functionality and the function of the T-cells giving us control of the virus. Remember, 95% of adults exposed to chronic hepatitis B will clear the virus and move on. So we have the capability to have a functional response to clear virus. So our question is, if we res reverse some of this immune dysfunction, are we able to get effective T cells which can control the virus? And this is where the focus around PD-1 will be over the coming years. What do we know from the cancer field? Well, we know from the treatment of melanoma, we know from the treatment of non-small cell lung cancer, that these exhausted PD-1 positive T cells could be reversed, and on reversal of this T cell exhaustion, we're getting marked recovery of T cells with marked improvement in treatment outcomes. Will, this be will we be able to translate this technology to hepatitis B remains to be seen. Well, how else might we look at this in the future? Well, in some of the very preclinical studies we've seen in the Woodchuck model, we've seen combinations of some of these agents, such as PD-1 blockade in combination with a therapeutic vaccine. So it won't just be a one or another, it will quite often be a combination of these various agents as we move forward to offer our patients uh, the possibility of achieving cure. And this is a slide that I have to update almost on a monthly basis at this stage, but it gives you an idea of the amount of molecules which are in development. And you can look across here and you'll see where they are in terms of phase, the phase of study, phase one, phase two, phase three. So close again will be uh, the capsid inhibitors, and you can see down here the host targets, such as Mercadex B, which is moving beyond phase two, and then here the immune targets, TLR7 agonist, PD-1 blockade, and RIG-1 and NOD-2. There are many of these drugs at various stages of development, and it's a matter of time before we see what we will adopt in clinical practice. So in summary, what would I say to you about the prospects of cure? Well, one of the main things that we've focused on over the past few years is how we better understand the immune response, which has the capability of achieving viral uh, elimination and surface antigen loss and immune control. So I would stress to you that the importance of a better understanding and a redefinition of this disease phase is really central to our ability to achieve uh, curative treatment outcomes. You and I know that in our clinics that long-term on treatment viral suppression, albeit the standard of care, this is clearly suboptimal for us and more importantly for our patients. We want to offer better treatments, we want to achieve cure and be able to discharge these patients from the clinics. But I think you will see over the coming years that any new therapy which is coming into the treatment arena will have to focus on the ability to restore this immune control, to restore this immune function, or to target the CCC DNA, which is the pool of virus which persists throughout our life, lifetimes and therefore allows reactivation and progression of disease over the longer term. 
Finally, this leaves me with my acknowledgements. I want to thank all the people who are involved in our work over the years. This is the Royal London Hospital in London where I work. This is the Blizzard Institute, our academic institute, and collaborators Malamani at UCL, Antonio Bertoletti here in Singapore, um, Alberto Quagli at King's College, and Bill Mason at the Fox Chase Cancer Centre. Thank you very much for your attention.